The Mind's Eye Podcast with BJ Turnoff is available on Stitcher Radio, Podbean, iTunes, and all major platforms. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Appreciate you. Feed your head, engage your brain, and enter the mind's eye, the intersection of history and mystery, the center for science and the strange, and your source for the subliminal to the criminal. No, not me. I'm DJ BJ Turnoff, host of this auditorium of audacity. Happy New Year, and you know what that means, New Year, and well, for this one, a uh, new president, and speaking of that, and check back on my website in the next uh, couple days because I wrote a piece inspired from Hamilton uh, and the upcoming uh, inauguration day. I wanted to get that in by. And with this piece, kind of my goal was to uh, an extend an olive branch to each you know political party, Democrat and uh, Republican, on behalf of each other because I know they can't do it right now. Um, but pretty much what I'm doing is I'm, I'm kind of chastising them a little bit. I'm also... Uh, also, lifting them up at the same time, I'm, I guess you can kind of look at it like I'm uh, kissing their cheek and uh, slapping their ass, but not the good type. Definitely look at it. It's a, it's a good one. Um, lots of history involved, too, of course. You know me. Uh, go to my website, themindseyemedia.com. Again, themindseyemedia.com. But let's talk what's going on for this show. We got the Sage of Sacred Geometry coming on in a few minutes. Uh, Richard Heath. Now, we've dove into this topic before, sacred geometry, uh, about four years ago, so check that out. I believe it was uh, t early 2017 or, or somewhere around that time, late 2016. The idea of sacred geometry is that uh, some people believe that there seems to be uh, you know, some type of mathematical design to the earth uh, and the universe, um, and if there's a design, then something intelligent must have designed it. Therefore, I guess there, there must be an intelligent creator or, or God. Richard's going to explore tonight how ancient civilizations built their monuments based on math from longtime observations of the cosmos. As a system designer and a student of the ancients' technical achievements, Richard Cannon has decoded the science hidden in the megalithic monuments. He'll share a little bit about that tonight. Um, we're definitely going to talk about one of my favorites, uh, the Great Pyramid in Egypt. Stay tuned. The Mind's Eye will return in a moment. Again, Happy New Year and New Year. New great news. Uh, Joanne Parks was just set free after three decades in prisoners, thanks to listeners like you. She was convicted of killing her three young children by burning down her house uh, and trapping them inside, as crazy as that sounds. Uh, and all of this was based on bad forensics evidence. Fantastic job by the California Innocence Project. Uh, also, like I said, by the many listeners like you who listened uh, from our episode about it um, with Ed Humes uh, and then did something to try and help her. Um, so really, kudos for you. I have some pictures of her uh, getting set free. It's on Twitter, at Minds Eye Show. We don't have any pictures of that on Facebook, but we got plenty of good stuff there like fascinating news articles about Stonehenge, uh, a family with no fingerprints, which was a recent post, and, and much more. Same name, at Minds Eye Show. Um, we also got information about tonight's guest who joins us uh, in just a few minutes, uh, Richard Heath. He's going to reveal how the number science found in ancient sacred monuments reflects cosmological wisdom when the Minds Eye returns. Let's welcome Richard Heath to the Mind's Eyes. Uh, I like to call him the, the Sage of sac Sacred Numbers. Uh, we're going to talk about his latest sacred geometry, language of the angels, uh, the latest of four on the topic. Richard, thank you for coming by the Mind's Eye. I appreciate it. Yeah, this five. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is the. Uh, excuse me. La uh, sorry. My math clearly hey, isn't uh, quite as it once yeah. was. This is the latest of cool. five. Four others. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate no, no, that. No, no, six. This is the sixth book. Oh, this is. Oh my I've God! Six books. I I have completely. And my wife reduced... is still here. <laughs> That's good to hear. She's sticking around. I didn't mean to reduce your uh, your work there to by numbers. Oh, no, no. You uh, got to get counted for everything. It takes a long time for me to do it right. Mm -hmm. Ryan. And, and by the latest, um, you could tell how much work that you do put into it because there is a lot of research yeah. and content behind it. Um, and and we're going to go into all of that. But first, before we do, no. for the uh, uninitiated, just kind of explain what sacred geometry is in conceptually. Um, there is. You know, it's uh, different people who have had different types of sacred geometry. Mm. Uh, I believe that the original uh, geometry 
uh, was used by the megalithic people in order to build things. And the other uh, geometry that uh, occurred after that was religious uh, uh, because these things were treated like sacred numbers and sacred geometries. And so they become part of a canon of architecture that begins in the ancient world. And then after that, we, you know, from the modern perspective, because obviously there's a big interregnum between, you know, the 2000 and, uh, I mean, uh, 2000 years, the last 2000 years, in which, from our point of view in Europe, Christianity dominated the thought, and in uh, other places, Islam dominated the thought of the people, and both uh, created a science. And in that, uh, analytical science had emerged in the Greeks. So there's another form of, uh, of geometry, which is modern geometry. So actually, there's a fourth in between, which is how, we, how, like, for instance, all the Gothic cathedrals were built with sacred geometry, which is different to the sacred geometry of the ancient world. So there are, in fact, probably four different types of geometries historically, and all of them uh, sort of coexist in one way or another by the time we get to today. Now, my own use is to try and reveal how they were able to do the astronomy through the megalithic work, uh, which is building these monuments that seem crude because they are large stones, but are actually uh, quite precise. Uh, and they were able to use long lengths in order to point to the horizon and the events and so that type of geometry allowed them to understand things which we can't uh, believe that they might have understood. And from that, there was a transmission of pattern from the sky, uh, which caused them to become, the megalithic people, to become numerous. Well, so your idea is that, you know, these megalithic structures um, are just are much more than just astronomical calendars is what some of them we kind of reduce them to they they represent um much more cosmological um i guess yeah. events than than what we believe now um yeah and why don't we go into True. a you know you use uh i would yeah. say during the book you, you kind of use four you use multiple ones but i would say you kind of use four main ones to kind of express this um notion These the great cool models uh, four yeah. models, yes, exactly. Yeah. Or megalithic structures to represent that, like the Great Pyramid, Stonehenge, um, Manio, uh, Quadrilateral. Those are three of the bigger ones that you talk about. Um, yeah. And we're not going to break them all down because obviously you want no. people to, to go into the book. But why don't you Read use, book, yeah. yeah, for me personally as a child, you know, Great Pyramid, that one always kind of confounded me. Um, and I've always had a great interest into that one. Um, so why don't you use the Great Pyramid as, you know, one of this as an example to talk about it, um, your concept of, of sacred geometry. The specifics, like you know, what what, well, what was it? Me what was yeah. it measuring specifically? What information was it conveying? Well, right. Well, the two models, um, a pyramid is really rather like a dome, uh, but building a dome is not easy, especially without concrete that the Romans had. And so, the pyramid is it's an enormous achievement, of course. Um, and its uh, primary dimensions are that its base across the reference side is effectively 11 units and the uh, the the height of it in its full form if it wasn't missing the top would be seven units which is a uh, a quadrant of a circle relative to the radius so it's a it's a reference to the f the first uh m geodetic model that they had uh, and many people have said that uh, the size of the Earth, it's, an, it's the northern hemisphere that's being shown. And when you break it down, uh, also, these, these sorts of models with circles and squares, if you look from above, the, the square of the base of the pyramid uh, encodes uh, four different latitudes. If you multiply it by its height, um, it's, you get a number, obviously, like an area. And those are the uh, the Nile Delta, the uh, the pyramid uh, degree. Uh, the next one south, and then there's one for for uh, Karnak, the temple complex in the uh, south down the Nile. So these sorts of codings are going on. But another coding that 
may have been in the pyramid is uh, of the uh, the lunar maximum that we're now approaching in the next year or two. It'll be, uh, and when that happens, the moon it rides very high. It rides further than the sun because it's like you add on top of the sun's orbit whereas in the minimum it, it rides underneath and then obviously it crosses at various times so this is a phenomena that's astronomical and that's another type of a, a situation where the area of the square equals uh, the area uh, with a radius of a certain number and these two numbers, like 18.618 years for the maximum to happen, and 33 years, which is the time associated with a solar hero, when all of the years cancel down to give you an exact sunrise, exactly in the same position as it was before. It takes that long. And these are all to do with numbers, the numbers like 11, uh, which is in 33. And this is the smallest number, pair that would work for equal area and so the solar system the, the geocentric system around the earth obeys certain rules that seem to have been created for it uh, because otherwise we have no explanation for why the numbers that are significantly the perfect numbers were actually used uh, for the moon to eventually end up in, a, in an orbit in which the orbit rotates its nodes, as they're called, the crossing points for eclipses, uh, it uh, rotates that in 18.618 years. Uh, uh, and then the length of the solar year uh, is exactly a number with a fraction, you know, less than a quarter, uh, which is like the fraction... Uh, that that has a 11 in its denominator. So if you if you have a factor of 11 in a fraction, then you multiply it by 11. It it removes the fractional part. So the solar hero religious idea, which is repeated even to, to Jesus living when he dying when he was 33 years old, these sorts of uh, story uh, contain in in textual references. Uh, elements of knowledge which are also present in the pyramid. How did you get turned on to this idea originally and you know and also tell, talk a little bit about your training because when I see a pyramid I, I see a triangle when you see a pyramid you see much more so tell a little bit about that training and, and how did you get turned on to this well, in general? My, my technical training of course just is useful for prepar preparing the mind but it was a technical one and so uh, when I inevitably got involved with uh, the internet and things. Later on, I uh, met my brother in 1992, and he'd just discovered the uh, the fundamental triangle of the sun and the moon, uh, and it had extraordinary uh, ideas in it. So I worked alongside him for the 1990s, and we uh, sort of established all sorts of things that must have been true, about the megalithic, a much wider notion of what they had learned. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he was publishing at the end of the 90s and still is, but I, I, I suddenly got interested in the solar system uh, from the geocentric point of view. And uh, maybe I, I could say a little about the geocentric point of view, because 400 or 500 years ago, uh, you will have heard in classrooms that that the heliocentric, the sun-centered system, had had been accepted eventually by the church, and uh, because of that, it, it opened the floodgates to the study of modern science. Part of your book, you know, it, it big con, you know, I guess premise of it is that sacred geometry is responsible for the development of human conscious mind. Was no accident. Hubris. Uh, which is a word used for proud, pride, pride. You're you're behaving as if man is the creator of the world. That kind of hubris also means that you don't see uh, the the problem, uh, and that you don't you you cut off anything that's greater than you were, 
Uh, and if the megalithic was as great and as widespread as we now know it, it was physically through archaeology, then this added meaning of the accuracy and depth of their astronomy and of their knowledge of the Earth uh, implies that that we are not wanting officially in all of our different pigeonholes of knowledge to recognize that a completely sort of like a universalist culture coming out of the Ice Age uh, was capable uh, of, uh, of building something. And, and also because all of the things in the sky were connected numerically in these peculiar and geometrically, they ended up creating these geometric models effectively a different uh, they weren't directly connected of course but they were they were transposed so they were transposing the the so-called creation of the geocentric world onto the surface of the earth itself and the, the what happened then was the, their mind was uh, inevitably made uh, developed uh, uh, with many of the characteristics that we now consider ourselves to be precious, um, and, and we talk of the cultural mind and the ability to uh, understand things, and understand our world, and so they understood their world through developing their mind by, by, and then then I think they discovered religious notions, because the religious notions come out of the idea of the Creator God. That if you think that that the the, uh, the world you're living in, and you've got evidence, which we don't have in our culture, evidence of this, uh, and you start to open up this, the idea of what does it mean that, that all of this is all because they they didn't have the picture we have now. They didn't have pictures from all over the solar system of all the planets. They didn't have. Uh, telescopes they didn't have pictures of galaxies and everything else and what they had though was the things closest to them uh, were the most important which was the moon and all the planets and so finding all of this intellectual content by reading it in a sense that's what I mean by the language of the angels did they look at like building did ancients look at building these monuments these megalithic structures as monuments proving god or monuments to the numbers that could possibly prove god uh, uh, they had no notion of what they were discovering hmm. it was only you know they had no religious um no sizable religious we can't assume that they had a sizable religious thought but we can assume that if they were discovering all of these profound relationships in the sky between things, turning a chaotic situation into a structured one, uh, that some thoughts about mind, touching mind, would inevitably have arisen. Mm. You know, because that's effectively what we do when we come into contact with a highly structured notion, you know, a, a book or something or a whole tradition or, you know, then that makes it like Shakespeareanism, for instance. It, it, uh, it certainly transforms people who become interested in it. And so I think that we mustn't try to say that, that they got their religion, if they had one by the end of the megalithic, from uh, the sky or from angels. They, they, uh, they found uh, evidence of a greater mind than their own, and their own mind was developed from it. And so in that sense, without that, I don't believe we would have had our civilizations after that point. Mm. And, and what about you? What, what do you believe? Do you believe that if, you know, I guess the idea is that if there is a mathematical design to Earth and the cosmos, then there must be an intelligent uh, must be intelligently designed. Then there must be a designer. Do you believe that? Uh, well, that's why I use the word angel because mm. I, it's a monotheistic allowable statement to have angels, <laughs> uh, uh, and indeed the tradition of uh, of angels is uh, it allows uh, you 
not to think that the planets are gods. And, but we're not saying that the planets are angels either. So what we're talking about is the kind of intelligence rather than exactly a mind that, that if you think about it, if you uh, were to create a universe and you wanted it to have certain characteristics and you want it to express life at some point, then you've got to know exactly what, how that's print, the principle on which that is going to happen. And these principles will be present in a way at every point inside that created world in, in being what the nature of this world really is, if we just look at it. And that the, the, the planets and the situation with a moon, a large moon, without the large moon, the Earth is unlikely to have had life. So it's not just a matter of being in the Goldilocks zone, it, all sorts of things are involved. The tilt of the Earth, the uh, stability of the tilt of the Earth, the Moon stabilizes to a large degree. And so all these things that, that uh, the Moon is doing, like protecting us sometimes from meteorites four and a half billion years ago, uh, and also, uh, you know, we ourselves were there's a, co a collision had to happen in just the right way in order to create the Moon, uh, and that was a traumatic process as well. So I put an appendix in the book for that general knowledge, which I got from the Geographical Channel. And it's you just got to see that the geocentric world is a different world from the rest of all the solar system. And the rest of the solar system are, in a sense, accessories for the living planet. It's and the sun is not central in that sense. The moon is central. And so the geocentric view and the heliocentric view are two valid views of the solar system, one based on gravitation, the sun, and another one based on the dynamics of having a, a large moon attuned to these outer planets and, in fact, attuned also in a more complex way to the inner planets also. Yeah, it must be pretty interesting to see the world in, in, in which you do. I wonder if you're like the guy from uh, Beautiful Mind. He just sees all these mathematical yeah. equations everywhere. And yeah, <laughs> he didn't have he didn't have post-it notes though. <laughs> that does make your he life a little. It probably would have made his mind a little bit more organized, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, well, you know, the the way that you see the world is is definitely unique, and I would highly recommend people get in the new book, Sacred Geometry: Language of the Angels. Give out your um, website because you got a lot of interesting information on there. Yeah, I try to uh, make it um, a, a supplementary source, and so it's on sacred dot number sciences dot org but if you put richard heath in and some other things like this you'll also of course find it uh richard i well, really can't i can't thank you enough you're you're a uh, number one guy in sacred numbers as i like to look at it uh i really appreciate your time thank you very much cheerio brian in mind's eye wrap up when we return okay last time i mind's eye wrap up here and uh okay the last time i'll say it new year but this time, it really is just the same old crap from uh, the New York Jets. That's my hometown team. Uh, uh, thank you for another year of sucking it up, uh, another year of not being in the playoffs, and there's an old saying, Jets gone Jets. Hey, it is what it is, but, but it is that football playoff time of the year right now where big money's really at stake. Um, with that much money at stake, do you really think that uh, – Sports profiteers are leaving anything to chance here. Uh, Brian Tohey, renegade expert sports watchdog, certainly thinks not. Uh, two weeks from now, he's going to join us, talk about his book, uh, The Fix is In, and then his most recent one, The Fix is Still In. Join us for that one, and if you're lucky, maybe, actually, I might, I, you know what, I'm thinking about doing that episode for the Hamilton one. Let's do a live version. Um, I'll make sure to post it a couple days in advance so you can read it. Make sure you go to my website, themindseyemedia.com, and uh, Twitter and Facebook at Minds Eye Show. Either way, whether I guess a week or two weeks from now, uh, until then, be well and let well be. I'm DJ BJ Turnoff signing off for the Minds Eye. The Mind's Eye Podcast with BJ Turnoff is available on Stitcher Radio, Podbean, iTunes, and all major platforms. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Appreciate you.